This episode of the SITREP Podcast is brought to you by our generous supporters on Patreon. Everybody and welcome to the next episode of the Sit Rep Podcast. This is your podcast for modern military gaming. And today we have most of the command crew with us and our special guest. And let me introduce the people at the table today. We have Ralph from Merry Old England. Hey folks. We have Jim from sunny Florida. Hey everybody, how you doing? And we have Alex from Full Battle Rattle up there in the great white north of Canada. Hey everybody. So this is G, and we are going to talk about what's been going on in the world of modern military gaming. Uh, We haven't had a standard podcast episode for almost a month. We did have a live show, and then we had the live roundtable that was filmed and recorded at Adepticon and obviously went out live as well. And I hope you all have had an opportunity to review that because that was a really good two hours worth of discussion between some of the leaders right now in modern military gaming from at least a miniatures perspective. There was, uh, obviously Alex is there from Full Battle Rattle. We had Chris Collins from the Families Consortium who represents Dish Dash Publishing, which is Skirmasangian and Ultra Combat Moderns. We had the Spectre team. We had Black Sight Studio Group. And we had uh, Kirk from Miniature Building Authority. So we had a really nice turnout. Uh, We spent a couple hours just talking about the business in general. Uh, We had a few beverages and some pizza and, um, you know, had some chuckles and had a couple of equipment things, a battery die in the camera because, you know, the computer lackey just didn't do their job right. Um, So things like that. But all in all, it was very very good and the comments i've been getting from people who were watching it or who have watched it after have really enjoyed it so um hopefully we can make that a regular thing at adopticon or at one of the shows where we can have everybody together so since it's been a while ralph what have you been up to um not a lot um preparing stuff for the ghost ops of course um which is going full steam ahead um, also, I started painting up my Spectre Spetsnaz, uh, so I've got one with a base green on, and I've started going around with the the light the slightly darker green because I'm going to do them in like a multicam. Uh huh. I've had a look at a bunch of you know different pictures of Spetsnaz um, uniforms, so I thought multicam in a like a green would be probably the best to do them all in. Um, so I'm going to get one done, see what it looks like, and if I'm happy with it, I'll roll out across the other ten Perfect. minis. I dry fitted together just to see if it, how it goes together. The Empress T14, which is the brand new Russian battle tank, which is an amazing resin kit. Actually, it really does go together smoothly. Um, so I dry, dry fitted that together with some blue tack. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just make sure it, it you still have to dry fit. You can't just, yeah. you know, assume it's going to fit perfectly and glue it and then go, oh, so. Exactly. <laughs> so, so we'll try for that. And then I haven't done it yet, but I've got a Tiger as well. I've got a Russian, uh, the, the transport, the Jeep. Oh, okay. The, the Tiger, which is the same on probably the equivalent to the, probably the one that Spectre thought about. Is it the M Tav or whatever, the, the new Spectre one that came out? The, the GPR cover? What, like the JTLV? The J. Yeah, it's the it's Tiger as I would say the Russian equivalent of that. Gotcha. Looking at it, okay. Um, because the different variants of it, one of the variants uh, holds up the ten troops. Um, so I've got one of them as well for the Spetsnats. So I've, I haven't built that together yet, but I've got that to do. So fantastic. Plodding along, and of course, reading through the second edition of the Spectre book. So what do you think of it so far? I love it. <laughs> I really do. I've, you know, I'm, I'm in the Spectre person on the on the group. I would say more, you know, and I like Sangin as well. But I think Spectre yeah, as a game system, it's great. I know there's been lots of talk, and Matt and Stephen have mentioned it about putting the point value back in. Yeah. Uh, as a as a supplement. Yes. On the website for free. Yep. Um, but I'm one of the games, uh, as we said on the my two cents from the the live the, the round table was the narrative stuff that Spectre seems to bring. 
within the modern space is amazing you know that asymmetric that that ability to create asymmetric combat with that you know where you have a small tf4 tf force against large numbers of militia and stuff like that's great and then of course with them releasing their salute mini and their adepticon mini everybody on the forums going right we want rules for this okay we want this we want this yeah so i could see people doing john wick style <laughs> games with one versus lots you know and then, of course, Matt turned out some rules for him that he just quickly put together. Yeah, I <laughs> so mean, it's, it, it's you know, brilliant. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to actually getting a good game in. I know we filmed a quick demo, uh, yeah. had some audio issues. It was a lot louder in the room than, you know, we were picking up. But um, mm -hmm. it's really good. And that whole, yeah, what is the name of the mini? Yaba Baga. Baba 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 Yaga. Baba Yaga. So Baba Baba Yaga, which is a Russian myth, a witch basically. It's it's a myth of a, a witch, gotcha. uh, a Russian myth, and it's the character that it's based on's nickname in the film. Oh, yeah. that's right. That's so, where I you know now that you say that that makes yeah. total sense. So mm -hmm. so but um. Yeah, it's 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 you know that they they launched it. I know on Friday because I was watching some of the wrestling because of course it's WrestleMania weekend and I don't like my wrestling. So on <laughs> Friday night there was um, <laughs> there was there was a live NXT. Uh, there was a WWE event and of course I've got the WWE Network, so I was watching that around midnight. Yeah. You know, time difference. And there was a load of people on the Facebook page. As soon as it hit midnight, going to the Spectre, Spectre Miniatures site to see if they could order it. <laughs> it's available till, uh, well, I should say it was because time is yeah, staring. It, it ends at midnight tonight, I believe. Yeah, but it wasn't available at midnight on Friday. It was yeah. eight thirty on Saturday morning, yeah. so it would have been roughly around the time I think as getting ready for Salute when they made it live. So very cool. But yes, it's a very nice mini. So, Hopefully they'll um, do some other ones. Are you doing Division Two? I have been playing the Division Two. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know I haven't streamed it. It's just. It's something I'm. I said I would, but it's something I'm quite. I quite like doing by myself and stuff. Sure. So I didn't want to sort of put it out. Sure. What I might do is, it the Division Two's now dropped their first content patch uh -huh. where they've opened up now. The game's fully open now. Um, the way it works is once you hit the max level, you enter something called World Tiers. Okay. World Tier One, Two, Three, and Four were the ones that were released initially so you you complete some missions that open unlocked each of the world tiers and that increases the difficulty it also increases the loot that you can get yeah um because uh for people who don't know it's called a looter shooter so you know you kill things you get loot and you move up as you move up world tiers you get better and better loot um they've just unlocked world tier five which is the final world tier and at the end of the month they're releasing their first eight player raid so I may stream some of the raid uh -huh. because it will be stuff that people might not have seen because unlike other games of this type, which I sort of fall under the MMO, yeah, uh, massive multi-online and then RPG for a role-playing game and so yeah. on, um, a vast majority of those, especially the big ones, World of Warcraft being one, raids have always been part of that. So you got to the end game content and then you had a group of 20 or 30 or 40 people go and kill something, usually a dragon. That's what the first one was, I think, if I remember correctly, in World of Warcraft. Um, but they never did it with the Division 1. The max level was four, you know, like a four-person a four -person team. But they've now created eight player, so you can have two groups of four joining forces to do a raid. And that's going to be the first one that they're, they're releasing. So I may stream that, but we'll, we'll see. But yeah. with other things going on, especially cool. if Ghost Ops coming around streaming that might might not be an option where go stops all the tickets to we say it's a president sure. yeah sounds good any other things ralph hobby wise not really um i was looking at i backed the kickstarter is it war it war 85 it's the hex based one that we were talking about yeah um there was an unboxing. Someone's done an unboxing on YouTube of the bits, and I think it's one of the creators. Um, but what's interesting is, even though it's a hex-based game, uh -huh. you get unit cards, and on those unit cards are stats for movement and firing 
four range at four different scales. So six, they can use it in miniature 15, space? Yes, six, oh. ten, I think fifteen and twenty-eight. So they put stat cards in. So you could actually take the rule set uh -huh. and use it as a miniatures game. Huh. Interesting. Mm. Why? <laughs> <laughs> and as far as that, uh, Hex Encounter games using cards, Axis and Alex miniatures has been doing yes. that since mm -hmm. 1998. Yeah. I mean, it's, 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 it worked. It worked okay. Um, it keeps you from having to put a lot of information on the counters. The problem uh, we ran across with Axis and Allies 15 millimeter was uh, it's kind of a hybrid. Uh, it's, it's a hex game, but you play with three dimensional playing pieces. I don't know if I'd call them miniatures. Mm -hmm. The problem there is that when your army list got too complicated, you wound up with uh, with way too many cards. You're basically playing 52 pickup with your unit cards. Yeah. Um, if your army was relatively simple, you know, a bunch of T-34s, maybe some infantry, some artillery. Yeah, like maybe four or five cards. It wasn't too bad for stats or whatever. But um, for an operational scale game or a command tactical game like like this uh, Storming the Gap in 85, I, don't, I haven't tried it. I'd have to look at the cards. It, it seems uh, like you'd either have to keep the scenarios pretty simple or it would have to be, uh, I don't know, the cards would have to be easy to handle. Mm -hmm. It was just just an interesting thing from a point of view of the way that you know you've got your unit cards, which you know are fine. It's it's for the hexes, you know, it gets the data, but the ability for them to put on um, like stats for ranges and stuff like that for different scales of miniature, which means you know you could technically use it as a version of Team Yankee or whatever, you know, instead of using those rule sets, mm -hmm. you're able to say buy a bunch of six millimeter, eight millimeter, uh, ten millimeter, you know, vehicles and roll them out. Yeah, do it that way. It's just an. I'm guessing it's just a, an interesting way of introducing those that have backed the Kickstarter, who don't normally do war gaming, into war gaming. Yeah, I just could see that. Interesting. So, very hmm. cool. All hmm. right, Jim, you're up. What you been up to? Uh, working. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, you're end of quarter, wasn't it? Yeah, first was end of quarter, and we were closing out Lebanon. Uh, the Arab Israeli War series on the Op Center and uh, kicking off the Falklands, um, getting the infrastructure for that uh, laid out. Yeah. Uh, finding the right games to play for the uh, scenarios that we want to uh, explore with those uh, with that those next set of Op Center episodes and um, you know buying those, play testing those. Setting those up so they can play in a web interface, uh -huh. so that we can play with you know people in the community or whatever. Uh, it's a lot of work. We're probably about halfway there. Um, the script for episode one is written, so now we just have to do a little bit more of um, a little bit more gaming, so that we have you know we have like a, a real gaming. We're not just making it up. We have like a real gaming element right. in our um, in our Falklands episodes, and. Uh, yeah, then just uh, finish the first episode. We're probably going to do three episodes for the Falklands. I think one of the mistakes we made with the, or I made with the uh, Arab Israeli War series, was we tried to bite off like too much. Um, we basically covered 60 years of history in four episodes. And so the episodes got really long, and we really had to brush over a lot of stuff very, very quickly. Here we're taking a uh, basically a, a 10 week war. Uh huh or six to ten week war, depending on whose definition you use, and we're breaking it into three episodes. So we'll be able to keep the episodes a lot more manageable as far as uh, production, as far as, you know, making people sit in front of their computers and actually listen to this jabber. And um, also, you know, being able to you know leave enough elbow room for enough detail and enough, you know, real uh, gaming information, not just, you know, an info dump of history. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to use at least four different systems that I know of um, to, to do some of these battles. Or at, I should say at least three, possibly four. And, uh, yeah, we'll see how it goes from there. But, uh, yeah, really busy, not much hobby, uh, just a lot of work Yeah. as far as, you know, graphics, video production, um, game research, for lack of a better word, learning new systems and playtesting those new systems. Well, if it makes you feel any better, Jim, the Op Center videos are our most popular and most watched uh, videos so far to date. So that's where we get most of our interaction from viewers and members of the awesome. community. So the quality of the work you're producing 
is paying off in dividends as far as the enjoyment factor for people out there. So just keep We're that in the back of your uh, mind. <laughs> What's left of my mind? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's not easy work, is it? You know, creating a really good no, video. No, and, it really is. It really isn't. It's, it's at least a five day process. Yeah. And it's, it's uh, just you, you know, it's not like some of these other places that have a whole crew that does some editing and does one does graphics, you know, you're the one band, man band. So it'll be, um, it's also, you know, like, like once we got Arab is really worse up and running was over because you have all of the maps pre rendered or whatever. Yeah. You know, most of all those maps are, are, are original, just, you know, boost stuff off the internet as far as our maps or things like that, um, or game counters, or pieces, things like that. It's just get Oakland's up and ready to go. Yeah. Um, so far, we've had some pretty good games of Air War 21. Uh, I'm sorry, Air War C21. It's a great little system that's available on uh, uh, that's on, uh, on War Games Vault. Um, tested it out. I played about seven or eight games of it so far. Had some pretty good dogfights. It's uh, it's a lot of fun. It's it's challenging. The game is simple. It's like chess. The game is simple until you make a mistake. You know, uh-huh. I should say the rules are simple. The game is the game is <laughs> the game will bite you very very quickly. Um, yeah, like don't ever try a split S and a Harrier um, <laughs> and not be going <laughs> either be going too fast. Don't try a split S and a Harrier going too fast. Don't try an Immelman going too slow. Uh, once a Harrier goes into a stall, it's very hard to recover, and Harriers are not. For you know, despite what we all see in the movies and the media, of carrier, I'm going to be saying this many times during this video series. Harriers are not fighters, never have been, never will be. Yeah, they were never meant to be. You try to use one like a fighter, and you're going to be in big trouble. Here's the problem: they're the only they're the only fighters that the Royal Navy could bring to that conflict at the time because they didn't have you know for lack of a better term, real carriers. They had these little light helicopter carriers, HMS Hermes, HMS Invincible, that could really launch Harriers and not very many of them. Meanwhile, they're up against supersonic land-based fighters. Long story short, the British are up against it, man, really. And the game really reflects that. And um, it's almost like a flight simulator. I mean, it's it's possible to crash and burn before the enemy even does you the courtesy of firing at you. If, uh, you know, you may... <laughs> <laughs> you make the wrong, you, you attempt the wrong maneuver with not enough power, not enough airspeed, and you don't, and then you get unlucky on the dice on top of that. Um, yeah, you got to be careful. Damn. Uh, but that game's that game's a lot of fun, and then we're uh, we're getting ready with uh, with Naval Command, which is going to be a lot less useful to be honest, um, because it's uh, most of the naval war. I use naval war in air quotes for the Falklands is going to be very. Uh, it's, it's very air fo- it's very air focused. It's really just airstrikes against ships. That's what 98% of the air war in the Falcons was. So there was no big naval battles, so to speak, uh-huh. just a lot of airstrikes. But we're still checking it out um, because, I mean, we have to have helicopters. You betcha. And uh, that's right. And Air War C-21 does not have helicopters. So it's a fighter combat game. Sure. So in order to... Uh, reflect all of the actual logistics inserting troops we did have helicopters sink and destroy the um, argentinian navy's one and only submarine to my knowledge uh there are some actual helicopters in combat in naval combat doing some stuff long story short we need another system for that so we're going to also use uh, naval command also available on uh on, on war game i want to thank ralph for bringing that one to my attention um You're welcome. I, I was set up to use something else a game that I, that I won't mention because I'm not going to say too many nice things about it. <laughs> um, it was not Harpoon. I knew Harpoon was too complicated for this. I had another system kind of teed up, ready to start using with this. I was like, eh, it's okay. I don't have to use it very much. But then this Naval Command system came along, and it's actually uh, going to fit a lot better. So, um, yeah, we're going to have some fun with that and, uh, and see where it goes. And then, of course, part that's going to be parts one and two. And then move the ground, and we're going to do some ground combat. There are some very uh, um, serious infantry battles. Uh, live bayonet charge, uh-huh. uh, at least to my knowledge. Um, you know, Lonkin Hill, Goose Green, Darwin, um, the, uh, Telegraph Hill, I think it is, radio, a wireless ridge. Uh, that there's, there's, there's quite a few uh, 
naval, ba- uh, I'm sorry, ground battles, all infantry, no tanks whatsoever. Um, there are some Amtraks at the very, very beginning, but they don't really do much. They get pulled off the island actually pretty quickly once the Argentines invade. Uh, so no tanks, very little artillery, and uh, yeah, it's all it's all infantry. Royal Commandos, Paratroopers, Royal Marines, uh, I guess a lot of Argentinian conscripts. So uh, mm-hmm. we'll see how that goes. And uh, yeah, that'll wrap us up for, uh, for the Argentinians and British and the Falklands, 1982. Mm-hmm. I the, cannot the, wait. Uh, the other thing as well, sorry, G, the, only, the, the other thing as well was um, when you went about ground forces in the Falklands were Pebble Island was hit by the special for- British Special Forces to take out the jets that were sitting on Pebble Island before the invasion and before the, the, the main force went into the Falklands to try and reduce the Argentinian air superiority that was around there at the time. We're talking about on the islands themselves. Yeah, on Pebble Island. Well, yeah, um, there's was, that, there's that, and then there's the Black Buck, uh, the Black Buck operation. We'll get all of that. I don't want to give away too much of the episodes, but no. the the the, uh, the bombing raid probably the only time the Vulcan was ever used in combat. Mm-hmm. Um, strategic bomber it was originally made to drop nukes in Poland and Russia, and uh, wound up uh, dropping conventional bombs on the Falklands. Oh, I uh, use the Vulcan. That's cool. They, they, oh, exactly yeah. once. It's a crazy mission. If uh, I probably won't have enough time to get into it in full detail in the episode, but they flew this thing from the center of England all the way down to uh, – because that's where they could base it at. Mm. They had to have something like f- one bomber – They had, well, one bomber and a backup. And then they had to have like 15 air refuelers in like these three waves like where tankers were refueling tankers. And those tankers were refueling other tankers, and then those tankers were refueling more tankers, and then those tankers were refueling the actual one bomber. It's wow. something like 17 tankers to get this one bomber 8,000 miles, 12,700 kilometers over the actual target to get one bombing run on the airfield that's right outside of Stanley. And the reason for this was to uh, force the Argentinian Navy and Air Force to operate off airfields on the Argentinian mainland. It's 400 kilometers away, like 320 miles. They were never going to take out the entire Argentinian Air Force, but if they could knock out their infrastructure or at least damage it, they never knocked it out completely, but if they could at least damage that that runway on Stanley Field itself, Uh what that's going to do is it's going to force the Argentinians to operate off the mainland, which is at the very limit of their range. Uh, so they didn't. So they they at least like got to fight the Argentinian Navy and Air Force at an arm's distance, as far instead of at, up at choking distance. Um, and it was pretty much just this one bombing raid of uh, of Vulcans or a Vulcan, I should say, huh. and dropped something like like twenty one thousand pounder twenty one one thousand pound bombs. Pretty much missed the runway because their their information was out of date. But they did manage to land one bomb out of their twenty one bombs square in the middle of the runway and uh, cratered it very badly and thus largely took that airfield out of the war for the Argentinian Navy and Air Force, at least for fixed wing jets. The, um, the Argentinians were still, launch- were still landing Hercules there the whole war uh, to land more troops and supplies and things like that. But they- so they couldn't take it out completely, but they did take it out for jets. Wow. It's a, it's a, it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, it's a fun read. It's definitely one of the weirdest, uh, and most, uh, it's one of those missions you read about in books and you're like, that's from a movie. There's no way that could that actually happen. And no, it actually happens. Wow. That is impressive. Stuff that movies are made of. Yeah. We wanted to hit the Falcons pretty hard. Number one, it was highly requested, uh, mm-hmm. from people who, who watch the stuff. Number one, but number two, I mean, Let's be let's be real. Like what we do here on the sit rep is modern wargaming, and ninety yeah. percent of modern wargaming is government troops versus insurgents, government troop versus insurgents versus militia versus oh look more insurgents, mm-hmm. and when you get done with arm with army versus militia, you have militia versus militia. Uh, you know it's it's all like this you know low intensity non kinetic asymmetrical warfare, which is great. That's why we love you know modern combat, yeah. but. There's also once I mean it's one of those rare gems when you get to well, these are actually two, uh, for lack of a better word, you know, Western industrialized nations going at it like they almost never do. 
since 1945. This is the only time you see two, like, I won't say first or second rate, but, you know, at least, you know, not guerrilla, you know, air forces going at it. Yeah. And uh, it's one of the only times you see naval combat in the modern era of any description outside of, uh, you know, drug interdiction, smuggler interdiction, Mm -hmm. or uh, counter piracy operations, things like that. Excellent. All right. Well, I cannot wait to see it. Um, And are you going to be, we're going to be broadcasting on an OTT or something as well? Yeah, we're trying to get Air War 21 broadcast live. Uh, I mean, we, we have a live stream for our games pretty much all the time. Yeah. Uh, Or I should say, Every weekend, but we're trying to get one embedded in um, in on tabletop, uh, you know, front page on the site, you know, front center or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it's just because some of the people on the team over there are just really interested in the Falklands, um, <laughs> which makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I mean, great. you know, it's the, 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 the United Kingdom. Uh, this was a huge win for them. Spoilers, you know, for anyone who doesn't know, <laughs> um, <laughs> the UK did walk away with a win there. Um, I like that. <laughs> it's you know. <sighs> And uh, it's recent enough where a lot of us were around uh, when this war took place. Yeah. Uh, this, was, this was one of the first wars I followed as a kid. I mean, as a kid, I was like 10 years old. You know, I remember there was a very busy summer. You had the uh, uh, you had Peace for Galilee, and you had this. And I was watching this, and this is what I watched when I was a kid instead of football, you know, or whatever. <laughs> You know, people were talking about, you know, um, Danny White and, uh, you know, the, the Dallas Cowboys in these days. And, you know, well, who do you like for the Super Bowl? I'm like, I don't know if the Argentinians have too much of a chance down in the fall because I'm <laughs> keeping a close eye on the PLO up there the, uh, in the Becca Valley. And what are you talking about? You're a weird kid. You know that? So, um, yeah, so a lot of people remember it. And, again, you know, uh, it's very, very famous conflict in the U.K., um, we probably have some members of the community who were in the service um, during the British service during this war. I don't know if they were actually there, but uh, you know, it's 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 a big thing. So um, yeah. it's not surprising that uh, number one, it was highly requested, and, and number two, that it was uh, you know that's it's gaining some uh, even though I, we haven't even started yet, and it's already gaining some focus over there on on tabletop and beasts of war. So yeah. very happy about that. Yeah, very good, excellent. Sounds like a full plate. So, Alex, over to you. What have you been up to? Um, obviously, you were away at Adepticon. How did you like Adepticon? Uh, I, you know what? <clears throat> Sorry, I, I love it. I look forward to it every year. Um, it's a great little event. Little event. That's not the right way to put it. It's a great event. Um, and it was good to meet everybody and, and uh, kind of had that. The podcast was a blast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, and then back here to reality, back to work. Um, so it's been a bit of a bit of a bit of a busy week. Uh, but I, I did get my John Wick model at Adepticon, so oh, I've been painting really? Baba Yaga. Yeah. Excellent. But that's that's about it. My hobby it. hobby time back to reality. Been, been huh? Minimal. Yeah. Back to reality. Yeah. Cool. Anything on the horizon for full battle rattle? Yeah, we're. <laughs> You know, it, it kind of stemmed out of the discussions at, at the round table um, and then, a, you know, a 12 hour drive back to Toronto trapped in a car. <laughs> um, and and we, we sort of came to the conclusion that, you know, I've been toying around with doing some kind of operator types, but everybody that they're they're out there already. Right mm-hmm. there. The, other people do them well. So what's what's the point? Um so I opened it up to kind of the, the bigger community to see what people think is missing, uh, which, you know, can be dangerous with gamers, right? Everybody, right. Uh, everybody wants that obscure thing for their scenario. But um, it, it looks like we're going to kind of do another round of, of grunts uh, as opposed to, you know, everybody's favorite operators. Uh-huh. So uh, one, of, one of my customers had sent me some great pictures from our uh, advanced land warfare training center of the uh, – Guys on the patrol recce pathfinder course. Cool. So I think I think we might do some recce debt recce debts or something like that. Um, you know, and, and move into maybe like a breacher with all this news of assault pioneers coming back and um you know, maybe a, an officer consulting his map. Yeah. Um, trying to figure out where he's found himself. Um things like that, maybe a forward observer, you know, all the kind of the extra stuff that the the the, the range now doesn't cover. Yeah. 
So I think I think that's where that's going to go, and there may may or may not be a G wagon model being worked on, hmm. Chris, wherever you are. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. So you're gonna have an officer with a map, like standing in the middle of a field, being confused? Or <laughs> oh god, yeah. <laughs> and I'm trying to figure out how to how to how to model the the good idea fairy sprinkling dust on the map, but uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's a little out of scale. You just, just got to look at that uh, that first episode of Band of Brothers. Captain Sobel, what is the holdup, Captain Sobel? Uh, a fence, sir, a barbed wire fence. That dog just won't hunt. Uh, <laughs> uh, Seriously, uh, so you're talking about, like, when you say grunts, are you talking about, like, non-special forces, uh, like yeah, modern just, soldiers? Okay. Exactly. Just, just awesome. more... Uh, an expansion of the range because we have, you know, guys kind of on patrol, guys fighting. We have a, a guy throwing his knife hand forward, so he's obviously in charge of something. Um, but we don't have, like, you know, I want to do a guy with a shotgun because they're getting used, right? right? A Remington 870, generally. Yeah. Um, I don't have uh, a, a marksman, like a, a designated marksman or a sniper or whatever you want to call them. So that's probably something I'm considering. Um, and it all depends. You know, I've got to look at... In Afghanistan, they were probably using an AR-10. Yeah. But now I think we've phased that out, and they're on to this. Oh God, let me see. C-14 Timberwolf, if if that's right. And then uh, and then potentially the McMillan TAC-50, the Big Mac. Oof. Um, but I I don't. That's where my sort of experience and knowledge falls. I don't know if those are making their way down to like an infantry attachment level. Um. And, and, you know, you, you nailed the, the scale of modern gaming earlier. I think maybe an AR-10 is probably more appropriate for most of the gaming people are doing. Right. I think, a, you know, a big a big 338 or, or a, a, you know, a, a 50 cal is going to be kilometers back that way, right? So I don't yeah. think it's going to need to be represented on the board. Well, a lot of the snipers, I, I don't know much about the Canadians, but a lot of the, like, Marine Corps snipers are still using, uh, like, rebuilds of the M14. Yeah, uh, I can't remember what they call it, like the M40 or the M21. Uh, who knows what they call it it's nowadays? An M21. It's a 308. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's the same basic, you know, maybe not exact, but it's a 762 NATO round or whatever. Yeah. The 308 yeah. hunting cartridge. It's you know, it's accurate out to a good you know 800 meters or whatever. The, the only reason and you guys know this better than me. I'm preaching to the choir, but for people who might be listening to the podcast, the only reason they go for those very very large um, like 50 caliber rounds is you know the distance. Yeah, uh, they're they're not trying to uh, you know blow people in half on purpose. That's not that's not the purpose. It's it's literally just a heavier round is going to maintain yep. its ballistic integrity over a much much longer distance, whereas a 308 is going to run out of energy long before then. Yeah, I, absolutely. I was just I was just looking it up. The C14 is a 338 Lapua, and then oh. we have then we have the other. I can't remember what it's called now, but it's a it's a 762. Like it's a 308. Hmm. But so that, that you know that's the stuff we're we're working on. Um, you know, possibly maybe like a visiting dignitary too. Um, you know, and maybe a general kind of those scenario figures. Yeah, they're always popular with people. Yeah. Um, you know, that type of mini being, yeah. you know, being a, an yeah. objective mini, show. we Exactly. Say. You know, they, we could do, there's there's great photos of, uh, I, you know, it was Stephen Harper and uh, might might even be Peter McKay at the time, who was our, our, our uh, Minister of Defense. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're walking and he's in full uniform. He's just not wearing his webbing, right? He's got his Kevlar on and there's a beret and maybe a drop holster, but there's no 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 vest. Um, and then Harper's wearing Kevlar and then civvy clothes. So, you know, a pair like that might be a fun scenario. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to make sure to also include a President Bush and um, give him a plus one dodge for um, people throwing shoes at him. <laughs> <laughs> I want to see that game on the tabletop. <laughs> Excellent. All right. I did a 50 cal. Spectre did a, 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 a militia sniper that has a Russian SOV 96 50 caliber sniper Oof. in a prone position. And that's a mini that they did. It's it's an anti material, it's an anti material weapon, you know, for like vehicles, basically. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, that yeah. was the, the original mini. purpose of it. It's not yeah. an anti personnel round. It's a. No, it's not. Yeah. It's, an anti no, it's, vehicle. it's not. <laughs> did, they, did they give you guys the same line they gave us, uh, G and, uh, and Alex? They used to tell us, uh, this is back in 89, 
like the 50 caliber, of course, we didn't have sniper rifles. We were just talking about like the M2. Uh-huh. Like the 50 caliber ammunition is by the Geneva Convention, you are not allowed to shoot it at enemy personnel, only enemy equipment. So if anyone asks, you're aiming at his helmet. <laughs> or you're aiming at his web, his web gear, or aiming at his his flak jacket. Uh, at his equipment, so. That's great. No, we never got that one. No, uh, I, I, we were told if it moves, you shoot it. Doesn't matter with go. what. So that was pretty much. No, we never got the. You can't use that round for that. Or nope. There's what did we we got something around a shotgun because uh, you know I don't think you're supposed to shoot people with a shotgun. They're a breaching tool. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's not your fault if the guy was on the other side of the door when you breached. <laughs> this is a, a slightly off topic, but we ran across the same question in our World War One series um, for, the, for the armistice late last year, where the Marines were using um, – it was the 10 gauge shotgun back in those days mm, uh, to clear trenches with. Yeah, they weren't playing around. Um, and Bella Wood and uh, the Argonne Force and all that stuff like that. And they're like, the Germans actually lodged because uh, lodged a, a complaint with the Hague and you know accused the Marine Corps of uh, of war crimes and using uh, un, uncivilized weapons. Jeez. This from the people who brought poison gas into the war. I always thought that was <laughs> yeah. a little. Uh, I mean, I'm usually very soft on the Germans, but I'm like, you guys, when you look the word, look up the word hypocrite in the dictionary, <laughs> you're going to see a World War One German general standing right there. I couldn't believe my eyes when I read that. Okay, so <laughs> I have to interject something. It's war. I I don't get this whole, it's a shotgun, you can't use it. You know, I, I just, there are some things I just, okay, poison gas, I get. You know, anything NBC-wise, I get. That, for anybody who doesn't know what that is, it's nuclear, biological, chemical warfare. But a shotgun, you know, I don't it's, know. It's it's mostly a medical thing. Um, I know. It's, uh, yeah, they don't use wooden bullets. Uh, the Germans were actually using wooden bullets against us for a while. That causes all kinds of secondary shrapnel. As far back as the uh, American Revolution, um, uh, patriots were casting um, musket balls with nails through them. And shooting, uh, you know, British officers with that, and the British, you know, lost their minds because, you know, how dare you? That's mm-hmm. you know, and it's, it's, it's anything that anything that makes the, sh- the the surgeon's job, you know, that much more difficult. When okay, you've removed him as a casualty, you've won, congratulations. Do you really have to make the surgeon's job that much harder? I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's where it comes from. Yeah. No, I know. It just you know, people say, well, it's not civilized. War is not civilized. You know. <laughs> It really isn't. When you come down to it, it's basic human animal instinct, fight or survive, yep. you know. To so. introduce into war a measure of restraint is an exercise in complete absurdity or something, Von Clausewitz said. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm probably not getting that exact quote right, but it's something like that. It's probably fut- futility. Yeah. Futility. Well, regardless, it's, you know, it's a – Nasty business all around. Um, all right. Well, what have I done? Well, we did Adepticon, um, you know, and all that stuff. I cleaned up my hobby room yesterday, and in discovering, I have about a battalion worth of modern miniatures to paint. Literally. <laughs> Literally a battalion. Like I just five about. Or I guys. kept yeah. finding. I I pull out a box here and I go, crap, it's full of minis. Um, you know, so I've got plenty of modern stuff to keep me busy. So I'm going to start doing, I bought, uh, Dave Taylor's book, the army legions and hordes. Um, and it mm-hmm. goes about how to do your paint projects and how to get through, you know, workflows and things like that. So it's, I'm going to take some good advice from that, you know, do project box. So it's not like it's overwhelming. So I do little bits at a time. So, I'm experimenting with uh, Alex's miniatures from Full Battle Rattle as my first organized. So I'm um, working through – I if you joined us over the live stream the other night, I did one of the command element from um, that set, and it turned out really nice. Um, and then I'm going to work on the other three minis in there. Alex, I have a question for you, and I don't know if I'm yeah. putting you on the spot for this. I'm looking at one of the minis that comes out of the command element. He has no weapons. Yep. He has like a just a regular old K-pot, Kevlar, maybe a vest. I don't even – what is he? He's an interpreter. Ah. Local, local interpreter. 
Gotcha. All right. So that's that's why his face is covered. Um, oh, you know what? I didn't even notice that. Now you say that. Yep, I get it. So All right. it, so he's wear he's wearing like the Canadian issue helmet without the cover. Okay. And the Canadian vest because we our vests aren't like the American gear that's got Molly on it. Uh-huh. Like they're so we wear a Kevlar vest with our plates and then and then webbing over top. Gotcha. So he he's just not wearing any any you know load bearing equipment. Gotcha. Okay. And then you could put him in, you know, jeans, whatever you want. Okay, civvy so he just civvy clothes with uh, the yeah. Kevlar. Okay. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So I'm going to get those painted up, uh, paint up the other squads or fire teams. And for those who have not followed us on Facebook or anything, I was the lucky recipient. I bought it. I think it wasn't given to me, but of the demo board from Spectre and full, um, from Black Sight Studio. Uh, from Adepticon. So we will be doing some demo awesome. Let's Plays on that board. So, yay. So I'm We're really happy about awesome, that. Actually. Yeah, it's really nice. Yeah, it was really nice, and I don't have to do scenery. I love doing scenery. It's, um, But, you know, if it gets us doing some videos quicker, uh, so much the better. And, and painting terrain is one of those things that it's super fun. Like the last 10%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. I'm, I'm with you on that like one. Grinding out hills and you have to actually build the buildings and you're like, Oh my God, you're working with plaster or Paris or God knows what. It's like, this is good. This last 10% of this is good. And that's when you're putting in like discarded beer cans on the side of your road pieces and signage <laughs> on your buildings. And you know, yeah. that's the fun part. But that first, like, 90%. So if you got, like, you know, the, most of it already built for you and now you get to customize it or whatever, that's the fun part. Yeah. Uh, that, so that's going to be great. I, I, I like it from beginning to end. Um, you know, I find myself watching a lot of YouTube videos from the guy that does Boulder Creek Railroad. Um, you know, where he builds this amazing terrain. And so I pick up stuff from him. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to getting some games on this demo board and then moving on to some bigger projects. But, yeah. Uh, I found my niche is I like doing bases. Um, you know, mm. I really like, you know, doing some bases like I did for the special edition miniature for Spectre, the one I painted up in the live stream a couple of weeks back when I did the base on that, you know, just doing anything a little special. But then I decided um, when we did the live stream this past Thursday is if they're going to be game pieces, I'm not going to do bases. I'm going to use the clear acrylic bases. So that way it kind of blends into the table and I don't have to worry about, you know, well, this is desert, this one's forest, whatever. I can just use it wherever I need to. So that's kind of my plan on that. Do you ever, do you ever have a problem with shine on those or glare or anything? Um, I mean, photography question? wise, possibly if you get the wrong angle, but for our, just playing, nah, it doesn't really matter. Oh, cool. I mean, if I you really need to, you Sorry. can always use a clear matte spray on it and reduce the shine a little bit. So I suppose you could water down some PVE yeah, and paint yeah. some water down PVE over the top to get rid of the glare. Yeah, but it doesn't look bad at all, um, especially you know for gameplay purposes. So doesn't it doesn't detract from the miniature? That's for sure. Cool. All right, so cool. let's talk about oh. some of the new. Did you have something, Ralph? Yeah, it was just um, when I do my bases now, I use the texture paints from Games Workshop. You know, uh -huh. the, the things like the Cracked Earth and things like that. Yeah. And then I dry brush over the top of them. So I, I base I base my, my Spectre minis on a 20 mil base. Uh -huh. I got, I've got a load of Spectre 20 mil bases that they recommend, basically because I've got a bunch of the Spectre um, plastic counters, you know, the things yep. for marking Overwatch and stuff like that. Um, but I, I quite use like using those like using those games workshop paints just as a as a size you know creating like cracked earth or mud and things like that and sure. then yeah. putting them up. Um, it's how I've done the base for the helicopter, which I need to finish. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I saw yeah. Ivan's pictures of his little birds and went <laughs> <laughs> cry. <laughs> yeah, I, it's you know. Like I said, I enjoy doing bases. I like doing them, but sometimes I get a little carried away like I did my SAS jungle guys. And I, you know, put really tall grass and, you know, had different, different types of foliage. And then, you know, depending on the board you're using on, it kind of just stands out for me yeah. from an aesthetic point of view. So if I'm wanting to play a game, 
I, I think I prefer the clear bases because it lets me play the mini and not worry about the base. So, you know, it, it's really a minute point. If some people could care less to me, I just, I think it detracts in my opinion. Um, so that's why I just decided to go to the clear bases to use it for that. And then my display minis, you know, I'll do fancy bases. So That's actually a really good point. As more and more combat in the modern era takes place in cities, i.e. your guys are on pavement, the crushed cat litter and little tufts of terrain grass look kind of weird. Yeah. This was in some of my, some of my um, Vietnam uh, episode or uh, articles a while ago i you know i base everybody out in the jungle and then i had it in Hue city and wherever anybody was running they had this little magical circle of uh you know jungle like <laughs> you know, it, it looks a little weird you're right it does it does start to look a little strange so that's that hey let's talk about some things that have been uh announced recently um why don't we start with bolt action Oof. so warlord games uh they Gave us a hint of it at Adepticon, but we couldn't say anything because they wanted to make the big announcement at uh, Salute yesterday for those – at time of recording, it was yesterday so um, – or this past yeah. Saturday for who are listening to it now. Um, they are bringing up Bolt Action Korea, and they showed off several miniatures, and I was really impressed. Um, they look good, mm-hmm. and they're Marines. What's with the Marines? Weren't the Marines the first one in, Jim, uh, in Korea? Was it Marines first? Uh, Marines didn't become super famous in Korea until Incheon, November 1950. Okay. That war starts in June or July. So if you want to get technical, the first people that really fight the North Koreans are the South Koreans. Um, and then the Army, like, desperately, uh, you know, shuttled some people in there. I'm not sure when the first Marine battalions were actually engaged on the ground, uh-huh. but they really found their fame starting with Incheon in, uh, I, think it's, uh, I think it's November 1950. Okay. A good s- five months into the war. So we're talking roughly five years post-World War II uh, for Korea. Mm-hmm. Um how much equipment was just carryover from World War II and how much came about from the Korean War? You know how like every major conflict, there's a rush of technology advancements in warfare. It kind of depends on your command level. Yeah. Um, for 28 millimeter infantry squads, I would say probably not a whole lot of stunning new innovation. Um, what's going to change is the mixture. Uh, so, like in a late World War II American squad, for example, what you might see is a uh, you know eight or six or eight you know M1 Garands and maybe one M1 Garand carbine and maybe one um, 30 caliber Browning. And then for Korea, you're going to see more of those M1 carbines. You see a lot more M1 carbines in Korea, mm-hmm. and maybe uh, you know maybe two of those Brownings or whatever mm-hmm. you know. Um, but you know, no gigantic you know leaps of uh, you know, um, of, of technology, at least on that level. They're still using the same 60 millimeter mortar to company support, um, up to 81 millimeter for battalion. That never changes. Uh, the 50 caliber is still there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you still see a lot of Shermans. What you're going to uh, we're now moving up to, you know, the next level or whatever, say tanks. Uh-huh. You're going to see a lot more Pershings. Now, Pershings are in World War II, so it's not a new thing. Yeah. But I think Pershing saw combat exactly twice as in exactly two tanks ever got to shoot at anybody, something like that in World War II might be a little bit more. Very, 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 very little. Obviously, in World War, uh, in the Korean War, they're going to see a lot more. They don't get to have a lot of tank-to-tank combat because there's not a lot of tanks uh, on the other side. Um, they're mostly used in artillery support. If you want to find the closest analog for uh, World War II to Korea, don't look to Normandy, look to Italy. It's um, it's a long peninsula. It's very mountainous, and um, it's mostly about artillery. It's mostly about infantry assaults. It's mostly about tanks being used as assault guns, and not the other way around. Mm. Um, probably the only real super huge leap that you see is at the next level, way up there, is where you see um, you know the first jet to jet to jet combat. You have F eighty six sabers versus MiG fifteens. Uh, a lot of combat is still propellers. Yeah, and it's mostly strike aircraft. People are still using Mustangs. They're still using the Corsair, B 
beautiful, the most beautiful aircraft ever designed. I'm sorry. Which one um, would that be? The Corsair? The F4U Corsair, yeah. Is that a Marine aircraft? Uh, Marine and Navy. <laughs> Bob Bob Black Sheet. <laughs> um, Japanese called it the Whistling Death because yep. it was just that awesome. Uh, the, the Navy also called it the Ensign Eliminator because it was notoriously difficult to land. If you could not land that thing on a carrier deck, if you were not experienced, you were probably uh, in for injury or death. So they were uh, – they were, they, were, they were not perfect aircraft. But anyway, um, as far as like big technological leaps, again, the higher up you go, the more you, you're you going to see, yeah. mostly in jets. But down at the bolt-action 28-millimeter infantry level, outside of the mixture of the weapons that you see, I don't think there's going to be too much uh, too much change. Yeah. You know what? So be- the, the North Koreans and Chinese are still using the PPSH and the PP-43s and things like that. Yeah. I don't uh, – I don't really see that big of a change. I, it'll be interesting. You'll see some new winter gear. Yeah, you'll see some yeah. of that. I'm sorry, what was that? Oh, you'll see you'll see more guys in in parkas and things like that that you didn't see in World War II, just from oh, a, yeah. a, a modeling a modeling perspective. Mm-hmm. Okay. The the first the first ones at the show because they've shown a Centurion, which looks really nice. The, the, the British tank, and then they had a bunch uh, around the Centurion. They had a bunch of British in their summer uniforms. Um, so it was the the, the cap and stuff because there's 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 you know lots of people have been putting photos out from what Warlord were were showing off. The other thing that they mentioned, which we have seen a little snippet of, was they're doing MIG Alley. So when you were talking yeah. about fighters and stuff, Jim, yeah, or Korean, they're doing MIG Alley for Blood Red Skies. So they're bringing MIG Alley to to that. Uh, the British and the Germans both had jet fighters barely. Mm-hmm. operational in World War II. They just never happened to meet. Yeah. So, so the first time you see jet-on-jet jet dogfight combat is, uh, and even that wasn't all the time, because again, a lot of the planes were so propeller-driven, but you do see jets on both sides. Mm-hmm. And for the first time, they actually do meet and uh, start uh, start trading kills. I tell you what's going to be interesting, if they do it in the rules, will be medi-evac. Are they going to do medical evac? And if they are, are we going to see a 28 millimeter helo from Warlord? It'll be an old uh, bell. What's yeah, that? it'll be an old bell. Yeah. In in that Centurion photo in front of the tank, there seems mm-hmm. to be some guys in white lab coats yeah. and, and hospital beds. <laughs> yes, I, yes, I, I yes. noticed that. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they've got um, – it's almost like, you know, in um, in their World War II set, they have Dad's Army set. Yeah. Now they have them off the well. MASH set, it looks like. I mean, all the characters, if you are a fan of MASH – you can tell exactly who everybody is. So uh, I'm looking forward to that because I actually which have Which version? There are, the, there are three versions. It's it's the TV series. It's the TV it's series. It's not the movie. It's the TV so series. So there's the movie. There's the early TV series and the post-TV. The, uh, the, the, the pre-Henry Blake, or I should say that there's the movie, there's the Henry Blake camp, and then there's the uh, this is Colonel, be, Potter. Uh, Colonel, Colonel Potter. Potter era. Here you go. Yeah, it'll be. Awesome. I mean, looking at it, That's I cool. see Klinger, uh, Radar, Colonel Potter, uh, Charles Winchester, uh, Hot Lips, Father McKay, uh, BJ Honeycutt, and Hawkeye. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you can definitely. What excites me about this more than actually being able to put them into Korea, because I, I, eh, I don't see how you play them, but um, <laughs> I have I backed a Kickstarter a couple years ago for a. Korean War MASH type RPG um, called Mashed, and these figures will play perfectly into that RPG. So um, it's that'll be pretty cool. But w- what I'm thinking of when Jim, you when you were talking about changes, and I was thinking about a rule is how are they going to address the Chinese horde? You know, because if you think about when you look at some of the um, narratives that came out of the Korean War, and these guys talk about how just wave after wave of North Korean slash Chinese troops just kept coming. You know, as, soon, as fast as they yeah. could shoot them down, more were coming. It'll be interesting to see how they put that as a rule into the game, if they even do. Uh, that would be tough, yeah. Um, I know that um, – I mean, I would also be very interested because if there's any part of Korea that I'd ever be interested in doing, it would be uh, the Chosen Reservoir. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, Marine Corps, right around Thanksgiving, 1950, uh, one or two battalions of U.S. Marines surrounded by eight Chinese divisions. So 
we need to pause and let that math sink in a little bit. So you're outnumbered about 40 or 50 to one Oof. and you're surrounded and it's like 40 degrees below zero. Um, but obviously those are all Chinese and you see the human wave tactics really used there. Yeah. Um, I, I don't really know. I know uh, flames of war has a kind of like a follow me um, special order uh, battle group has a rule called the Ura for the Soviets. And it's basically where, Okay, normally it's like, okay, you've got 10 units of, say, say we're talking about um, the Ura order in World War II Soviets. So you've got, you know, 10 units of infantry on the table. Every activation, you move one unit. Now the German pulls a chip. Okay, now you move a unit. Now you move a unit. If you can invoke the Ura rule, you move one unit and you make a die roll, all those units move together. Mm. And you basically get this gigantic wall of just brown, you know, uniforms screaming yeah. with bayonets, you know, coming straight at you. Um, something like that. I don't. I don't know how how um, Warlord's going to do it. Um, I mean, they've come out with great games for since God knows when. So I'm sure they'll come up with something. But uh, there are people who have tried similar rules like that before. So yeah, we'll have to see. Yeah, uh, very interested in looking at that. So. <clears throat> Also coming out of Salute was from White Dragon Miniatures. Um, he is releasing an IDF Force and a Merkava. And there was another vehicle, wasn't there, Ralph? I'm not sure. Um, I, th- I, I caught a quick glimpse of it because um, there's nothing on the web page. Um, but there was a quick glimpse when, when um, it's... Did it, um, did it look vaguely like an M113? Might have been, but it was when Justin was doing the walk around before the setup for um, OTT, um, yeah. and he got he stopped off at um he stopped off at past White Dragon, and he he mentioned because we knew they were coming. White Dragon are doing they're doing the Afghans to go with their British. Um, it looked like as well that they had a British, uh, possibly a Foxhound or something as well. I think that's due. Um, but there was definitely the Israelis. Uh, someone, someone on Facebook posted a picture. I'm trying to hunt them out. Andy posted pictures to was it uh, Andy's act to our page. Up, yep, it was Andy on the sit rep page. Yep. Mm-hmm. Uh oh. So there's a. Uh, we were talking about it in during the live stream. He's talking about the the Merc of a two. I think he was, which is. Um, Okay, so the Merkava 1s and 2s, according to what he's telling me, I thought it was just the Merkava 1s, but he, he's going to know better than me, so I, I totally defer to his judgment. Um, the Merkava 1s and 2s are the ones that carried the old 105 millimeter gun, so we're talking about Lebanon, or at least that era, 82, because they switched over to the 120 pretty quickly, same way the Americans did with the, with the Abrams. Um, and as far as like, okay, that's your Merkava, that's your main battle tank, if you have another vehicle for the IDF, what's it going to be? Right. It's either going to be the M60 with the Blazer armor, or it's going to be the Zelda, which is basically their version of the uh, of the M113. Yeah. They didn't really have any armored cars. Um, some Jeeps. I, I hope it's not like half tracks. No, it's they, two they were, armored vehicle, they, two tracked vehicles. Um, I can see the Merkava. I don't know what the other one is. <laughs> to me, it almost looks. I'm looking at a very small picture of it. I can't get it any okay. other. It almost, uh, I, I wanted to say it looks like a Sheridan, but I don't think it is. I don't, I'm not sure what it is, to be honest with you. Uh, I'm trying to get there. Okay. That might be one of the later uh, M60s. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I see the uh, reactive armor panels on it. So I'm just I think it's uh, very interesting that, you know, somebody's producing an IDF. Um, I'm not familiar with too many companies that do one. Um, so. there, there really aren't very many at all. I was doing this whole up center series for four parts. I was, I was basically up to my neck in the Arab Israeli Wars for the better part of six weeks. Yeah. And, um, you know, you want to include miniatures or whatever. Of course, you know, Battlefront has all their oil war and their fate of a nation stuff, so there's plenty of 15 mil out there. But for 28 millimeter, I was actually kind of hard pressed. I, I, these hadn't come out yet, so I didn't, I didn't get a chance to include these, unfortunately. Yeah. I found some from Mongrel miniatures that were pretty good. Okay. But that's just going to be infantry. There were no vehicles at 28 mil. A Merkava in 28 mil would be 
damned awesome. I don't know when you would get every kid a chance to use it, but it would be fun to build, fun to paint, and just put it on your shelf and just, you know, marvel at. Awesome. All right, guys. Uh, any last minute add ons? We're going to kind of call this a small show today because Jim has some big time gaming to get to. And <laughs> we have a little bit. I did push that back about half an hour. Did you? So, what are you playing yeah. today? Uh, we're doing Lebanon again. Um, Fantastic. A, re- a request for uh, Valorant Victory Lebanon in 82. Just a small one. Are you streaming uh, so I uh, I certainly hope to. Okay. Fantastic. So, uh, any last add-ons, Ralph? Um, nothing, really. No. There's nothing outside. It's been, shall we say, quiet and... Um, other than Salute and Adapticon, I think that's been mainly it. Um, I know there was a mail went out from Colin at Dead Slash with uh-huh. an update yep. of um, some pictures of his, some more of the Russians that they're doing, which I know you've got a hold of some of the minis. I do. Um, and also part of that email was noting that anybody that had ordered the minis mm-hmm. only, I think they're going out now. Yep. Yep. Um, they're going out now, so anybody that like myself that got the rule book and that backed it with the rule book, and I think that'll be end of end of the year sort of thing. November yeah. time, I think, was the the release date that that Colin put out of for that, that for the Kickstarter. Um, but other than that, it's been quiet. The only other thing I can may say is that it's a little suggestion I got from Andy, and I want to thank Andy Zach for that. Was um, when I was building these Russians, uh-huh. I decided to to take a bunch of the Empress heads I had lying around with the single monocle. The monocle optic, yeah, because I've seen a load of pictures of the Spetsnaz using the single optic, not like the quad or the dual. Um, so mm-hmm. I took a pair of um pliers and <laughs> and sliced all the optics off a bunch of Empress heads to stick on the Spectre minis. And Andy gave us a little suggestion which I actually used, which was a small piece and it'll work for the Spectre minis as well. Now, we all know the Spectre minis are really nice and you come with a septic optic, which is really difficult to fit. It's really finicky to fit on on the heads um, because they're not one piece um, casts. Yeah, Um, a small piece of blue tack or um, thingy to on on where the optic sits. Um, So all I did was I put a small piece of blue tack on and then took some gorilla glue and put it over on top of it and it's held it in place perfectly. Awesome. So to to line it up and get it in position and then a small piece of blue with a small piece of blue tack and then just some glue on top of that and it. Seems to hold it. Andy knows a lot of. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Are we finished? No, that's it, Maiden. I was just saying, Andy knows a lot of tricks about yeah. how to save a miniature. Yeah, I bet. He has, he has totally saved some of my, my LRDG guys for the Bolt Action Boot Camp. Mm-hmm. Totally saved him. Totally we, saved him. We need to get Andy on, I think. Well, I've been yeah, trying to get him to do some uh, live streaming for Present Arms mm-hmm. so he could do some mm-hmm. of his painting. So he says he's interested. It's just a matter of getting it coordinated for his time frame. So. Yeah. That's the thing. And then, Alex, we wouldn't mind getting you to do uh, one. You could do Cad Pat. Yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> and you could do the toothpick trick. Oh, no, I use a brush. Do you use a brush? Why, why exactly is that camo flat pattern so hard compared to others? It's I mean, not. It's just it's okay. a digital pattern. Any type of, you um, know, you could do uh, Digicam yeah. and Marines. He's still... It's still a pain in the butt. So, which yeah. which is Catpat? Little known trivia: we licensed it to the Marines. Oh, no, really? So yeah, even the, the poor Marines, Marines don't even have original use it. camouflage. <laughs> no, it, uh, you'll it's steal a variation of Catpat. We steal from the best. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, you know, painting digital is about faking it. That you just got to make it look right. It, yeah. There's no way you're gonna paint the pixely bits properly right yeah. you just got to kind of make it look like it's supposed to yeah that's that's, that's the key that's the truth so now, we'll, we'll see now if, if we people can... are interested though in 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 the history of uniforms it's called there's a youtube channel which has got all of that on including cat pads and it's called uniformed uniform history there's a link on it on the modern miniatures facebook page or huh. their facebook page awesome Someone's posted up and it's a full history of cat pad. And the, the last video they did six days ago was the uniforms for screen, uh, for screen, toy, so- toy stories, plastic soldier men. Hmm. So I'm assuming we can say history of the I'll plastic soldier men. I'll have to take a look at that. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the show. Just a couple little things. Um, I'm still working on the Arma 3 server. 
Uh, I found out what the problem is, why people can't connect. It's my internet provider. They blocked out the port, so I have to get them to open it up, and then that should open up the server for people to join. Um, mm. I'll be working on that. And then uh, we have two winners to announce. Um, our Facebook winner, because we hit over 200 followers. and Awesome. Yeah. And that is Benny Lava. So Benny Lava, we'll reach out to you. You get a set of the Sitret Podcast dice bags. Um, so we'll get your mailing address, and those will come either from Annie over at Cozy Dice, who creates the bags, or from us here, uh, depending on which side of the ocean you're on. And then on the YouTube portion, uh, since we had over 150 uh, subscribers, um, the mug, one of the sit rep mugs, which I have in my hand right now, uh, the winner is the Kilted Privateer. Love these names. So we'll reach out <laughs> to you too and get you a mug. Um, also, we need to make sure we thank our Patreon supporters. And at the team supporter level, we want to thank Anthony Watts and Lawrence Townsend. At the preferred members, Jennifer Lemon. And our producers, it would be Dennis Cross, Dylan Asmus, Michael Bradshaw, and JJ. So from everybody here at the Sit Rep Podcast, we want to thank you very much for your support. And without you guys, we could not do it. And if you're interested in any merchandise, check us out at zazzle.com slash sit rep podcast. And you can find our shows on all our media channels. Um, and for the whole crew here at Sit Rep Podcast, this is G. We want to thank you for joining us. You guys have a great week and we'll catch you soon. Take care. Uh -huh.